From a studio high above the clouds of the Okanagan Valley, this is the Cannabis Podcast. Exploring the world of Canadian cannabis culture, one toke at a time. Now, here's your host and bud tender, Gary Johnston. Welcome back once more to the Cannabis Podcast. This is episode 111, which is actually the first episode of year number five. We've been doing this for four years now. Hard to believe. Welcome back. If this is your first time, well, an especially warm welcome for you. We're going to fill your head with information about cannabis for the next 30, 40 or so minutes. And just want to remind you, this program is intended only for those 19 years or older in your jurisdiction and is intended purely for entertainment purposes. You should always consume your cannabis responsibly. As we start the first episode of year number five, we got a lot of things we're going to do in this episode. We're going to spend some time offering some gratitude for some of the people that helped me get to this point, the fact we've been doing this for four years now. We have a feature interview with Alfred Schaefer. He's the president of the Retail Cannabis Council of BC. We'll hear his thoughts on the industry and how we're tr- how they are trying to encourage improvements. I have a story from India where some rats ate some evidence in jail, that evidence being cannabis. Plus, on Cultivar Corner, we're going back to some listener-grown weed. This is from my buddy Ken from this year's crop of Sirius 6, and I was seriously impressed. All of that and more on episode 111 of the Cannabis Podcast. And I wanted to start off the first episode of year number five with some gratitude, some acknowledgement and some thanks for some of the people that have helped me get to this stage. Thanks first and foremost to my son, Ian. He not only encouraged me when I had the idea of doing this podcast, but he wrote and performed the Cultivar Corner jingle. He does my introduction and the liners for the show. Thank you so much, son. I really appreciate your contributions. They have helped make this show successful. Thanks as well to my daughter-in-law, Christine. Christine gave the Cannabis Podcast that shiny new image with the logo she developed and the artwork. I'm thankful for that every single time I create a new episode. And as a follow-up, all of the cultivar corners that she fueled by gifting me weed during her driving practice, (laughs) I should let you know the ultimate result. She passed her test. She got her full license this year after all of that driving. Thank you so much, Christine, for everything you brought to the show. And while he hasn't been a big part of the podcast because the day this episode is released is his birthday... I also have to send out a big happy birthday to my other son, Sean. Sean is a great daddy to my granddaughter, Fiona. Thanks as well to David Wiley. David is the founder and head honcho behind the OkanaganZ.com website. And of course, The Ounce, the print magazine, The Ounce. David has given me lots of encouragement along the way. He's been a guest a few times and has helped me spread the word with advertising in the OZ. Thank you, David. We got to get together and share another joint soon. Thanks to every single one of my guests who I've had a conversation with over the last four years. Each of you has contributed something special to the journey, and each conversation meant so much to me. Thank you so much. Thanks to Dan Humiston. Dan invited me to join the PodConnects network of cannabis podcasts this last year. Excited to be a part of that team and excited to see how the network continues to grow. Thanks as well to Corey Waldron a Mood Cannabis in Nanaimo. Corey has not only been a guest a couple of times, but he's always sending suggestions along. In fact, one of his suggestions is today, my interview with Alfred Schaefer. That was Corey's suggestion. Thanks for joining me along the ride, Corey. I really appreciate it. And thanks to everyone who's offered suggestions for the show over the last four years. I appreciate your input, too. And speaking of input, thanks for all the samples of weed you've shared over the last four years. (laughs) You know who you are. And I thank each and every one of you. And speaking of thanks, thank you to my subscribers, William, Kevin, Rob, Jordana, and Christine, J.S., and Lloyd along the way as well. Thank you so much for your support. And thanks to everyone who's bought me a doobie at buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast. I appreciate every single gesture, and trust me, I have smoked every single doobie. And let me also thank members of my family. My wife, Jan, for example, for being quiet in the house on recording day. My brother, Bill. Bill is always coming back. He's a constant listener. Thank you for being here, Bill. And Bill's daughter, Angie, my favorite niece. 
Thanks for coming along, Angie. My other brother, Don, who I don't think listens, but he has been the subject of a story or two. My nephew, Brock, who's my other brother, David's son. David has nothing to do with cannabis, which I find interesting because his son's kind of a big proponent of cannabis. In fact, Brock and I shared our first joint this summer. And my in-laws, Carolyn, Marion, David, they all occasionally stop by for a listen or two. Thank you for being here. I appreciate it. And thanks to you for being a listener. Whether you come back for every episode or you just drop in once in a while, I really appreciate your support and I hope to continue keeping you engaged with content. And speaking of content, guess what? After four years, there's now a total of 66 hours of content about cannabis on this podcast. That's a lot of content that you have helped me build. And I thank each and every one of you. And if I haven't mentioned you specifically to thank you for your participation in the podcast, and you think I should have, remember, I do smoke some cannabis, so sometimes my short and long-term memories may not function exactly how I want to. So my apologies if you feel I have not mentioned you like I should. It doesn't matter how high the THC is. The entourage effect is always waiting for you here. This is the Cannabis Podcast. I recently had the opportunity to have a conversation with Alfred Schaefer. Alfred is the president of the Retail Cannabis Council of BC and also a member of the Retail Cannabis Council of Canada. And he shared his thoughts about what's happening in the industry and how they're trying to make it better. We pick up the conversation just after I welcomed him to the Cannabis Podcast and asked him about his background. Give me your cannabis story. How did you get involved in the cannabis world? Yeah, for sure. I mean, so, you know, I grew up in uh, Smithers, BC, where I'm I'm coming to you from now. Um, so it's like, a, for people that don't know where it is, it's a small town kind of in the middle of the province, although we call it the north because, you know, most people, <laughs> as soon as you get past, you know, the first hundred kilometers up north, it's basically the north when it comes to BC. <laughs> but uh, it's like a small kind of mountain town. Um, you know, if you really like fishing, the outdoors, skiing, it's a great place to be. And you don't really, you know, especially if you uh, enjoy being in less populated areas, then yeah, it's definitely a great place to be. And I guess that's kind of where my journey started. Um, I don't know if I should tell the story, but I'm going to tell it anyways. <laughs> the first person who who actually offered me cannabis was was my old man. He was you know big enthusiast, and I was probably too young <laughs> at the time. But my, it actually kind of, to be honest, it turned me off of of, of weed because I was like, what the hell? This old guy likes smoking weed. It must be lame. So I didn't really start getting into it till I was in in my 20s, which you know maybe my parents were happy about that. I don't really know. I don't think they really cared since my old man, as I said, offered it to me for the first time, but. So that was kind of, you know, that's that's kind of where the journey started for me. And it was, you know, the first time I really smoked weed, it was a life-changing event for sure. I remember yeah, uh, just it's thinking so true, that isn't I... It? It's such a marvelous plant. Oh, it's crazy. It, like, you know, it's funny because I had some, I have, yeah, I'm wearing glasses, but I, uh, when I first took that first, you know, puff and got kind of high, like I could... I swear I could see better. Like my vision became sharper or something. So it was like, it was kind of like a pretty, it was a pretty fast realization that it was a good thing for me anyways. So um, that's that's kind of where it started for me. But from a, I guess from a professional side, it, it didn't start until legalization happened. And uh, it was actually a couple months before October 17th, um, a good friend of mine and previous business partner approached me and he's like, Hey, we should start a weed store. Like, looks like it's actually going to happen here. And, uh, so we just kind of started planning from there and yeah, we got another buddy on board and, um, we opened our first store in, in Smithers here on, uh, October 17th, uh, 2019. So it was a year after the legalization, but, uh, yeah, that's where it started for us. And, um, identify what the store is for me, Alfred, what is the name of your store? And, and do you have more than one? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, our store is called Rural Leaf Cannabis, um, and we have three locations, actually. One in Houston, which is kind of the town over from Smithers, and then uh, one just down the road in Fort St. James. Um, and then we have uh, another store that we partnered up with some some local people down in Valemount with, and uh, that one's called Robson Valley Cannabis Co. Um, and we actually were just about to open another one in the town on the other side of us, which is Hazleton, uh, called Fireweed uh, Cannabis. So... Yeah, that's kind I of have where cousins we're at. who used to live in Hazleton, so I'm familiar oh, right with on. that part of the province. Yeah. yeah, it's a 
beautiful yeah, very cool town too yeah yeah, that's a beautiful so that's part of the province. It's it. I mean, BC in, in and of itself, there isn't a bad spot in it. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's um, cool. So, so that's kind of where you got started, and now mm-hmm. one of the things we wanted to talk about, uh, Alfred, was your involvement with the Retail Cannabis Council, both of BC and in Canada, because here we are. Health Canada is uh, currently doing a review. It's important mm-hmm. for all of us to get our ideas out there. So yeah. tell me what first got you involved with the preceding organization of the Retail Cannabis Council of BC. How did that all start for you? Yeah, so so previously, yeah, we were called Acres originally, the Association of Canadian Cannabis Retailers. Um, and I got involved uh, back in 20... That would have been 2019. Yeah, it was just before... It was a couple months before we opened the store. And uh, I just reached out. I can't remember if they reached out to us first or we reached out to them. It might have actually been Lori um, Wit- Witzel, who was uh, one of the previous directors there, um, who I think she may have phoned my partner, Peter, just kind of cold called him and uh, started talking to him. And then Pete was kind of excited and uh, he talked to me about it. And so I reached back out to them. And um, yeah, I mean, it was just like at that point, we didn't you know, we were kind of in the application process and we just didn't have it very much information about what to expect, you know, milestones kind of things. And so I just wanted to basically talk to some people that had been through it and um, just kind of start to network with some, you know, some people that were already had stores open and, and even just, just to have like a network of support really like, um, you know, and Lori was great. Like she, so I, we joined up and then they were in need of a board member and it was kind of good timing and I had a lot of uh, passion and time to give. So um, they, <laughs> I don't know how, but they took me on. So I became one of the directors and um, yeah. And then from there um, I just kind of kept at it and I, I really enjoyed their approach and um, yeah, Lori, like one of the original board members, she, she was really great. Like she, when we first, you know, opened up our store in Smithers, like I, I had no clue how much to order of what and, you know, of each category and like even the products and stuff like that. So um, I just reached out and she was super, super helpful. And uh, like there was guys like Andrew Gordon who were on there at the time. Um, I, I don't know if you know Andrew, but he's, I feel like everyone knows Andrew. So he's a great guy. Um, and Jeremy Jacobs was the president at the time. And I just really like, I just really liked those people and they were like, pretty inspiring uh for me just getting into the business to kind of talk to because jeremy was you know he was in it from the previous days he had a dispensary in the gray times um and andrew you know he's been around the business for a long time too so um and then Lori, you know she came to it she was the second license i think issued in bc so i mean that in and of itself is like a huge achievement (laughs) just getting to being one of the first ones to jump through all the hoops so i mean it was yeah she's kind of a legend herself for that so um, yeah, it was just awesome to hang out with them. And then, uh, eventually Jacqueline Pahoda joined up as our executive director. And, um, I mean, for anyone that's met Jacqueline, she's a force of nature. So, oh boy, you got that right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. Yeah. I obviously know her. So, but yeah, I, I was just happy to, to kind of join up and, you know, uh, represent the retailers. And, um, one of the first things that I kind of did when I joined up was I, I phoned my MP and just kind of explained to him some of the hard, some of the issues we we're having at the time. They're like really different kind of ones that we we're facing then as opposed to now, you know, he was nice enough to get on the phone with, uh, uh, I can't remember who, but he basically set up a quarterly call with the LDB for us and, um, yeah, that was good because, uh, you know, the, the approach we've always taken is, is one of partnership and we don't, you know, we're not just out there like yelling at the province, like, Hey, this is all messed up. Like, you know, we, we usually come, we identify problems and we try to come with solutions. Um, so it's, yeah, we try to take a partnership approach to it. And, uh, you know, there's things that they like when they're launching, you know, legislation or regulations, like they don't really know all the time what the effects are going to be. So sometimes before then we'll talk about it and yeah, we give our feedback and I, th- I think it's been a very productive relationship for uh, both sides. So it's been good. And you used to turn a phrase a, a little uh, while ago that I really liked in the gray times. Uh, and I, <laughs> yeah. and I hadn't heard that, that, that term before. And, and it, to me, it makes a whole lot of sense because there certainly were gray times in BC. 
Absolutely, yeah. I feel like we kind of almost invented the gray times, if anything. Yeah, <laughs> like yeah. with Vancouver, yeah, you know, passing their own bylaws way back in the day. So with the work that you've been doing uh, with the Retail Council, what kind of successes have you had to date, Alfred, that, that have given you that inspiration to keep going? Um, well, you know, there's been quite a few things like, uh, uh, you know, the, pr- the security... Um, clearance that the bud tenders had to get originally that was kind of one of the things that we pushed for them getting rid of it so that was an easy one like red tape reduction kind of situation is better for them to be honest um it was such a prohibitive kind of like regulation like i know we had one bud tender and he he couldn't work for a while because basically he (laughs) like he'd been robbed at some point and um he'd made a police report and like anyways for some reason this is what had come up when he went to become a bud tender and that jammed him up for like three or four months so it was just like these are the kind of things that were getting flagged and it was just like super super restrictive and unnecessary um some other things you know like direct delivery we consulted with them a lot um about that so that was uh that was a big win coming up with that there's definitely been a couple of things that we've had conversations with them and they've been open to so um, yeah, it's been good. Two weeks ago, I think we, we founded our CCC, so the Retail Cannabis Council of Canada. Um, and yeah, we're made up about a thousand stores, I think, across Canada, like uh, around 800 in Ontario, and then uh, 40 or so in Saskatchewan, and then yeah, the rest in BC. Very cool. And, and so what is the mandate of, of the new organization? Well, you know... <laughs> We're, we're still working out the mandate, but the mandate essentially is uh, to, you know, have have at least get the concerns of the small retailers um, in front of the in front of Health Canada for the legislative review, um, because, uh, you know, with there's a lot there's been a lot of talk about it, obviously, lately. Um, and there's multiple different people that are lobbying for different things. But the one thing that we kind of noticed was that the, the retail voice was um, it was only being represented by a very narrow portion of the market. And the independents were basically being left out of that conversation. So, yeah, we saw a need for that. And that, that essentially is our mandate. Bringing that voice to the table. And, and that's a key voice that, that needs to be heard for, for the changes to happen right yeah absolutely i mean we think so we're um you know we're the boots on the ground the ones that you know are seeing the the customers and understanding you know what their needs are and um and how all these things that they're governed by kind of affect them so yeah absolutely i think that that is a very important voice to have out there because i mean we're the ones that kind of see what the consumers want more than anyone um so that's yeah i think that needs to be heard yeah it certainly does because it, it hasn't been represented enough to date with the uh, the work that you're doing now that of course health canada is actually beginning their three-year review at year number four uh what kind of things are you as the council putting forward uh towards those discussions yeah i mean it, it basically falls to four things um so there's the the 10 milligram uh, edible <clears throat> limit for packages um as i'm sure you're aware of uh you know so you can only buy edibles with a maximum of 10 milligrams of thc and this is you know this is something that if most of the things we're concentrating on are, are areas where the black market still retain a toehold on uh, the market and edibles is definitely one of them. I mean, like, uh, you know, I, <laughs> if you like edibles, you're not really going to come to one of our stores and I don't blame you because they're like, you know, the cost is, is high because you're, the packages only contain a certain amount. So for the LPs, it's probably maybe almost something they like because it's, you know, you can theoretically charge more for less because of the way that it's it's set up but i think that that is actually hurting everyone in general because i don't think that the people that are really into edibles are coming to the stores because you know they've got their reliable source that they've had for a long time and they're going to get it from there and i you know i don't blame them at all like if if i that if that was the only thing i could if i was a consumer i would be doing the exact same thing and i was into edibles so it yeah, makes sense I agree. okay so that's number one what's number two uh, number two, we're you know we want to look at the the possession limit and and we'd like to see that go up a bit. It seems a bit ridiculous, and this is kind of the same argument. It's like these are the places where where the black market has their toeholds, um, and you know like if you come into a store, you know in any kind of rural part of the country, there's already some distrust of of these what they call government stores, what some people will call government stores, even if we are private retailers, you know because we're selling government weed um <laughs> so there, there's already some distrust and when we start placing barriers in front of them like well you can only buy 
30 grams at a time, which, you know, that's, it's not even, this happens every day, multiple times a day. Like if you're working it up at the front of the store, this is gonna be that awkward conversation you have like at least once a day. It's like, you know, some guy, someone comes in and they buy a, an ounce and then they want to get a couple pre-rolls and it's like, well, sorry, you can only get the one. And then it just creates like a very, uh, like distrustful sort of thing. And like, it's just super weird. And I mean, it's hard to understand how, how that is in the, public like how they are protecting the public through this because i mean most of the stores and i know that the bcldb is doing this they're like the first ones i heard about doing this well they'll do this in separate transactions so you know they'll sell someone an ounce and then they'll ask them to leave the store and come back in and buy whatever it was that they were going to buy next so the rule's not really being followed I don't think it's protecting the public. I think if anything, it's creating more suspicion between the retailers and the public and potentially keeping them locked in, uh, you know, buying from the black market or the gray market or what have you. So uh, I just think that if the government needs to reevaluate if their intended goal is to protect the public, they need to take a look at it, especially these two, because they're, they're, they're definitely barriers and they're things that, again, maintain that toehold on, on a part of the market, you know, for the retailers that, our biggest competition is absolutely the black market, so. Yeah, still is, that's true. Okay, so those are the first two points. You said you had three elements you're thinking about, or four. Yeah, the next one is is uh, bringing in the marketing in line with what alcohol has for marketing, you know, for cannabis. Um, you mean they can do marketing? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah, like there's not much that we can do. And I mean, you know, for a new industry, it's like, how do you really, you know, get, get even tell the consumers that you're out there so that, that we just like to have a couple more tools in our toolbox to basically take on the black market. And, you know, there's no restrictions for that side. So if we can get a little bit, then, you know, at least we could do that. And then lastly, uh, it has to do with, I'm forgetting the subsection, but it's subsection C. And it's basically the thing that rules um, all of the exposure of cannabis to youth. In particular, what we're concerned about is the, is the window coverings. Um, and I, I'm sure you may have heard about this from other people because it's, it's one of the most common complaints across the country is about the window coverings. And the problem with the window coverings is aside from, you know, it, keeping the stigma there that cannabis is, is this awful thing that we need to hide away, even though like you can't even see the cannabis, you're just, you're seeing the packaging on the outside. Um, I mean, it, it's just, you know, you, they let kids into liquor stores and no one really bats an eye. So anyways, the window coverings, coming back to that, it is definitely a safety issue. We've seen in uh, Alberta that there were stores being targeted. Um, and because no one can see what's happening inside when the door is closed, there's there's a, there's been a couple, uh, I can't remember which police forces um, were saying that people should start taking these down. But basically it's not, again, it's, it's another rule that the reasoning at the start may have been sound, but what we're seeing in reality is it's actually causing more harm. You know, it's making dangerous situations for retailers, like people are getting held up and no one can even tell from the outside. And um, I think that's one that just uh, a lot of people have, have issue with. And I mean, I don't know if we're talking about cannabis being legal and we're going forward. I mean, at some point, we're, we're going to have to kind of start addressing the stigma around it. We've spent so much time talking about how bad it is. We should maybe <laughs> spend a little bit of time just kind of, you know, I don't know. I'm not saying we should be promoting it. I mean, obviously, we're promoting it, but <laughs> like there has to be some middle ground where it's like not completely evil. It's not radioactive. You're not going to die when you see it. Like, <laughs> you know, anyways, <laughs> but I digress. I like that it's not radioactive because... Because the stigma just drives me insane. It's my biggest pet peeve of what has happened in this industry, that we are still faced with that. And you, and you mentioned the liquor stores, and I was reading the legislation. The problem is, it specifically states in the legislation, unlike liquor stores, cannabis retail cannot have minors in the store. <laughs> like, yeah. they're already setting us differently from yeah. that perspective, and we had one of those come into the store again today. So, yeah, yeah. It, is, it is really bizarre how, how we've gotten to that stage. Have there been any of those pain points that have been identified that, that you haven't talked about yet that, that you think are important for the council to deal with either in BC or across Canada? Well, you know, in BC, for sure, there's definitely uh, a, a different list of problems um, that we're advocating for. Things like density are something that we've been thinking about uh, that's affecting a lot of our, our members lately. 
we're looking like the density that we currently have in BC, we're almost at the point, you know, that we saw Colorado kind of reach. They, I think they have one store per, I want to say 10,000. 10,000. Yeah. Yeah. And we're, yeah. That's the I, value. I think we're about, I think we might be uh, under that at present. I'm not actually hundred percent sure about that, but we're, we're getting close to that point and they definitely lost some retail stores at some point, right? They had to have go through a bit of a right sizing. And so, I mean, that, that's definitely a concern for, for our members is like, are they going to keep just shoving stores everywhere? And obviously, you know, there's still a bunch of places that don't have cannabis stores in BC. So clearly like stopping, licensing is not the answer because there's there's deserts out there for sure but it's it, that is a concern that absolutely is a concern for our members right now and again as a as an organization there's only so much you can do because it's the municipalities that have to step up to to change those particular laws is there any advocacy that you're doing across those municipalities to try to encourage them yeah for sure um so we right now we're um we're just in the process of like finishing a deck and we're gonna, uh, so the way, like all of our outreach usually comes from individual members. We'll do like government relation kind of committee meetings and we'll come up with resources that we can present to whoever it is. Um, and one of the, one of those things was, you know, like outreach to MPs or MLAs. And now we're working on something, a presentation to give to mayor and council at basically anywhere our members are that just kind of explains who we are number one who we represent and kind of some of the issues that we're facing like on a on a provincial and specifically kind of a city level and density is you know definitely going to be one of those things for sure yeah it certainly is it's, it's becoming more of an issue yeah absolutely i don't know if you heard but there there was like a grass on the hill kind of event in ottawa like on october 17th and we're planning on doing a similar thing in Victoria. And I can't remember the date now. I think it's November 24th. Um, so we're going we're gonna to also do, do some advocacy in that regards. Um, we're going to try and get a bunch of members up to, to Victoria there and talk to some MLAs. And so just so kinda... des- describe the, uh, the grass on the hill that you referenced. I, I'd heard just a passing reference to that, but I didn't hear too many details. Yeah, so the the one it that event is one that C3 puts on the Canadian Cannabis Council in Ottawa. They do that and they get like so the C3 uh, I think they represent they represent like a bunch of the big producers. I think it's George Smitherman's um society. So um yeah, and they you know, they so they put on a bunch of stuff up up in Ottawa and uh they talk to a bunch of MPs and um have some networking events and those kind of things. Talk to a bunch of uh, stakeholders basically. And that, that that's a great, um, it's really great that they put that on. So we kind of, we went there in concert of that, uh, just like the RCCBC and the Craft Farmers uh, Co-op. And so we, we kind of did our own little, you know, we just, our own kind of like not as big, <laughs> basically just me and David Herford talking to some of the MPs from, from BC and, uh, and yeah, and the Pacific Caucus and that kind of stuff, so. Well, thank you for your participation in all these councils and representing the industry, Alfred. It's it's really nice that people like you are stepping up and taking those roles because not everybody is willing to do that. What do you see as kind of your biggest challenge going forward with either of your councils that you face at this point? With RCCBC, uh, right now we're we're just we're really trying to get the rest of the retailers to join up because you know right now we've got about a third of the retailers in the province. And um, we really would like to be representative of, of most of the retailers in BC. And I think that we're kind of, we're at one of those points where it's like, you know, we've gotten decently big, but uh, we're just like in the weird growing pains of like not quite having enough people, <laughs> but like having a lot of people, I don't know, it's hard to explain, like all these volunteer kind of things, you know, there's so... <laughs> It's really what you put into it, and we've got a really good team, and we actually just got some new board members. Um, well, Andrew Gordon rejoined, and uh, Oana, I can't remember her last name, but from Ex Canada, uh, Capel, I think, um, she also joined up, and they're, you know, they're really engaged and energetic, and, and that's, a, that's a really good thing. So, I mean, yeah, I think that's one of our challenges, is just kind of getting people that are engaged and that are willing to give their time and, and volunteer, and um, it not just kind of coming down to like four or five people that are uh, really just 
hustling as hard as they can. But that's what happens with volunteer organizations often, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. So I mean, uh, that's a huge shout. Like we are trying to trying to get get more folks to join up. So right now we're just kind of pounding the streets and and trying to trying to get some more people signed up. And and you know, it's it's huge benefits. Like beyond just having a you know a network of people that you can talk to. I mean, like that one's huge. Just like being able to phone someone up and being like, hey, what's what's doing good for you? Or like, you know, or even just being able to talk to someone about maybe some kind of HR relations or things like that right like um that's absolutely a big benefit and and also just having a a voice in in what it is that we are pushing at a provincial level because we are meeting with uh you know people within the provincial government within municipal governments pretty often actually i forgot one of the biggest actually one of the biggest ones we had was uh, Vancouver dropping the price of their uh, their license cost for retailers. Um, it was like some absurd number, like thirty thousand dollars a year, and now it's down to something a lot more manageable for businesses. And that was that was one of our initiatives as well. So I mean, just 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 you know, like we are talking to these people, and um, we absolutely want to represent everyone. So like. You know, we need people to, to kind of join up and, and have their voice heard. And I think that makes our message more effective. So that's that's definitely one of the biggest, biggest challenges from a provincial level. From a, from a federal level, I think right now there's a lot of voices yelling at a couple people. I, I think one of the biggest challenges is like, well, if you're government, it's like, well, who do you even trust out there? You know what I mean? Like, who is actually a stakeholder? You've got these big companies, so obviously you need to listen to them because they are a massive part of the market. But then like, who else is out there and who, and you guys are all saying different things. So what are the actual issues that are affecting people? And I think that at a national level, the industry really needs to coalesce and we need to, you know, it can't just be like retailers, independent retailers, private retailers, or sorry, public retailers, and then like LPs, big LPs, small LPs, like we all need to kind of start coming together at least and, and talking about some of the same things. Because I mean, our message will be much more effective if we're all saying the same thing. And the thing is, we all need to kind of talk and convince each other and hash it out. And then we need to approach approach the feds and be like, look, these are the things. And uh We've all talked about it, so I'm I'm hopeful. I know there's a there's a bunch of different kind of meetings that are coming up here in the next month or so, and a bunch of different stakeholders are even coming together. So, hopefully, yeah, hopefully we'll see a little more solidarity, I guess, in the in the Canadian cannabis field. Yeah, let's hope so. It's because I think a consistent message is important as as we go forward. So let's hope that does develop the way you anticipate it does. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, like, uh, we have such an opportunity, like we're the, you know, Uruguay legalized before us, but we're basically the first country to legalize the way that we did. Like we went all retail, you know, like whatever, recreational. And like we had a massive head start, but like before you know it, Germany is going to be legal and the States is going to be legal. And as soon as those guys go, it's like everywhere is going to be legal. And then we might not be out in front anymore. <laughs> We're just going to be like another head in the crowd, basically. So I, I don't know. I mean, it would be nice. I would hope that that, that legacy of, of cannabis in Canada is, is something that's here to stay forever. But I think we got some work to do. I would agree. Well, let me finish off, Alfred, with my hot seat questions. Thank you for a great conversation. You've given me all kinds of information about the Retail Councils of Canada and BC. Again, thank you for your work. I I really do uh, appreciate that you're putting in that effort and helping out all of us in the industry. Well, thanks for for having me on and and, uh, hearing what I have to say. I really appreciate it, Gary. So my first question, what's your favorite cultivar? Uh, My favorite cultivar? Um, Oh, my God. I don't know. I mean, I'm a big... I like Indica. (laughs) Um, I'm a big Indica guy. I mean, okay, to be honest, one of my longtime favorites is, oh, I might get in trouble for this, but I, I really like Afghani Drifter by uh, Greybeard. Big, big fan of that one. Sure. I mean, like anytime you open up that yeah. seven gram. Yeah, that's nice. Anytime you open up that seven gram <laughs> jar, it's like there's always some massive bud in there. And I mean, for me, I don't I know. I just buds love are just that. so beautiful. Oh, yeah. they're amazing. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Uh, joints or vape? Ah, joints for sure. Yep. Yeah. Although lately, I got to say it's more dabs than anything else, <laughs> to be honest. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Dabs are cool. Yeah. I've, I've, I've done a little bit of that. Uh, I haven't picked up a rig yet. Uh, mm-hmm. I've got one of those uh, grab straws. Um, oh, yeah. And I've been kind of playing around a little bit with that. And, and, and it allows me to, to play with them. So what's your favorite part of, of, of doing the dabs? 
Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. It's like, it's, it's sort of like a ritual, I guess, like it, as it is with all weed okay. smoking. Like I, I kind of like, so enjoy, much, yeah. like, <laughs> you know, like when you, you, like, I just, I don't know, like it, say it's like a Sunday, whatever afternoon, like you clean out your okay. dab rig, it's all sparkling and shiny. And then, you know, that first like dab you take off of a clean rig, it's, I don't know, it's just a good. It's magical. Totally. I just like, you know, you heat it up, you wait for the thermometer to tell you it's the right temperature. And then I don't know, it's just a good, it's just a good overall experience. I, I like the high off of dabbing too. It's like, it's like a much okay. more, I want to say it's like more clear headed kind of a high, like it's okay. easier to kind of like keep working and <laughs> like keep on focus, oh. but also be oh, very cool. <laughs> I don't yeah. know how yeah. that even yeah. makes sense, but <laughs> it just feels like a much more, yeah, it just feels like a cleaner kind of like, I don't know. Yeah. Hi, yeah, I guess. Very cool. Well, it is a personal experience, isn't it? Totally. Um, yeah. Your favorite munchie? My favorite munchie. Um, oh, I don't know. I love some like uh, black pepper and sea salt chips. Probably. That's probably my favorite. Oh, munchie. that'd be nice. Yeah. Of course, the black pepper would probably act like some caryophylline and affect your high. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe. <laughs> yeah, it's possible. Um, and uh, final question, edibles or flour? Oh, definitely flour. Yeah, I'm uh, definitely okay. a big flour guy. I, you know, it's, I don't know, yeah, like do. edibles, it's a different kind of high. Um, I'm not sure what it is. It is. I was talking about this the other day. Mm -hmm. Like, I, there's definitely a time and a place, but uh, usually flour. <laughs> yeah, I me. haven't had much success with edibles myself so far, so it's definitely flour for me, too. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Well, thanks so much for being on the Cannabis Podcast, Alfred. I really appreciate your time today, and um, you enjoy the rest of your evening. Yeah, thanks again for having me, and uh, yeah, for getting those voices out there. Really appreciate it. THC, CBD, terpene profiles, what's in me? Oh, please explain to me. Go to the corner, go to the corner, oh yeah. Go to the corner, please explain this stuff to me. On Cultivar Corner today, we're sampling some listener weed. We haven't done this for a while. I guess it's harvest time. <laughs> Or pretty darn close to harvest time. In fact, some people's harvest was in the summer when my autoflowers were done. And for many others, it's harvest time. And some like to share that harvest, and I am especially grateful. Now, here, here's another thing about our industry right now. That, I mean, we're all excited about legalization. We can smoke weed. We can share weed and all of those things. But there's still that hesitation amongst many of us to literally jump up and, and declare, here I am and, and here is what I'm doing. <laughs> so, to keep in line with that, I was sent some weed by Ken, who lives somewhere in British Columbia and has been growing weed for a number of years. Ken actually sent me some last year, too. Well, let me tell you, Ken has stepped up his game. <laughs> Ken, wow. What are, we, what are we talking about? Let me give you the, the cultivar that is our focus for this cultivar corner. And this is one that Ken grew, and it is Sirius 6, a seriously sativa dominant. Sirius 6 is an F1 hybrid. It's almost pure sativa strain, inducing pure energy and dope format. The strain derives from Canadian genetics, which were mixed with African land race sativas. And upon testing this strain, anise, spicy, and citrus flavors pleasure one's taste buds. Sirius 6 provides its consumers with clear-headed highs and functions as a creative muse. 50% of Sirius 6 phenotypes will develop pink pistols, which are visually appealing. The strain is mostly recommended for outdoor growers. Indoors, the variety needs to be attended by experts to thrive due to its massive size, and Ken does grow outdoors. It takes Sirius 6 around 55 to 60 days to finish flowering. The strain delivers around 400 to 550 grams per meter squared of buds, which is quite solid. And one of the specifics, of course, this, I don't believe, has been tested for THC, so the strain itself expected to be around 17% THC. The first thing I was most impressed with when I opened the bag, wow, the aroma that popped out of here, probably one of the most impressive I've smelled of late. Mmm. Just such strong, and so the smells are sweet, spicy, and citrus. 
Oh, and it just, the bag is filling the room with the smell. Really, really impressed with that. Now, do I see any of those pink pistols when I pull out my jeweler's loop? No, but that's not all that unusual, is it? We don't often see all the specifics that they're talking about. But I will say, as I pull that jeweler's loop up and take a look at some of these buds, there's a fair amount of trichomes. I'm pretty pleased with what Ken's managed to accomplish with this outdoor grove, Sirius 6. Looks really nice. Buds are nice. They're not huge buds. I mean, there's a couple of big ones, but mostly, you know, they're what we would probably consider popcorn buds, but that happens to me when I process my weed as well. Uh, it has been nicely trimmed, nicely cured. One of the things I love about the fact that we have legal cannabis in Canada now, and we're, we're past the four-year mark, and we can share. You, you can give somebody up to an ounce of cannabis, and... I think that's just a fabulous part of our industry, fabulous part of the legalization. And that makes it possible for listeners to share weed with me and me to be able to give some critique of, of that weed and, and share in the joy of the bounty. And I'm sharing in the joy of the bounty right now. So here is Series 6, grown somewhere in British Columbia. And I am truly hoping for that strong sativa effect today. This is the first of my day off for the weekend. Want to work on the podcast, obviously. That takes a little bit of effort. Edit the interview. Get the cultivar corner done. So I truly am hoping for some of those serious sativa effects. Again, I'm really, really impressed with them. Just the smell that's coming out of that bag and and I have to give props to Ken for the for the curing and for the trimming that he, that he's done really a nice feel on it take another look at that yeah you've done a good job on that Ken thank you for sharing the bounty as well um, now I'm not sampling him in this case but Mr. Ken is a uh, <laughs> prodigious grower and he does some other things, too. He also sent me a little sample of some hashish. Mm. Two types of hashish, actually. A mix ice hash. So that was a mix melt and then a full melt uh, with Bruce Banner. But look at that. The Crafty Plus is ready. I've had a couple of hits. Starting to feel those happy eyes going. Let's do the vaporizer and see what it tastes like. Oh, a lot of those spicy notes and the citrus notes just come flying through in the vaporizer. Mmm. Nice and smooth. Same thing with the joint. And the quality check on the joint. Nice white ash coming off of that. Joint staying lit nicely. And the taste continues to delight off the Crafty Plus. It's nice to be able to share some listener weed and that was homegrown and to give you the concept of, if you haven't tried it yet, there is possibility for you to grow some weed and it's not all that difficult. For example, this is what Ken said about this crop. This was actually a volunteer that started on the side of the pot. He got about a pound in the end. It grew to about six feet. Very easy to grow. In fact, in Ken's words, this is out of the alto, all of the all of the outdoor plants, apparently I'm a little high too, <laughs> out of all the outdoor plants I've ever grown, this one stands out the most. No special equipment needed, no greenhouse needed, very easy to grow. Serious 6, is it? And they talk about those serious side effects, and uh, are they serious effects? Not necessarily side effects. And I'm liking them. Focused, cerebral, creative, uplifting, energetic, all of those things floating through my brain right now. Again, indicated of THC of 17%. We've been doing a lot lately in Cultivar Corner where our THCs are getting up into the high 20s. Should this have a, as big effect on me as it is at 17% THC? I think that's kind of validating the fact that those THC numbers are not necessarily everything we're looking for. <laughs> now, this could be higher than 17%, but... Ah, this is a really nice sativa. I've got to give you props, Ken. 
making me feel very fine on this morning. I'm feeling that focus, uh, definitely cerebral. It's way up in my head. I got the happy eyes. I'm feeling a little creative, starting to mumble a little bit, starting to ramble a little bit, meaning that there's some uplifting nature, some energetic sides to it. Uh, I'm pretty pleased. Sirius 6, a seriously sativa dominant strain, and can a seriously sativa grower? <laughs> Good job, Audie Ken. Thank you so much for sharing. I'm going to spend my day with Sirius 6. Sharing stories about good weed while trying good weed. This is the Cannabis Podcast. And let's finish with a rather bizarre story from 420intel.com about rats being blamed for eating 500 kilograms of cannabis stored by Indian police. Rats in northern India have been accused of eating hundreds of kilograms of cannabis seized from drug dealers and stored in police warehouses. Rats are small animals, and they aren't scared of the police, noted a court in the city of Mathura, after hearing that local police were unable to furnish almost 200 kilograms of confiscated cannabis that was supposed to be used as evidence in a recent case. Court documents said the police had been asked to provide 386 kilograms of cannabis, but the prosecution flagged to the court that more than 700 kilograms of marijuana stored in various stations across Mathura could be impacted by the rat infestation. And this was, allegedly, not the first time the rats had struck. The judge hearing the case cited Mathura police as blaming the rodents for destroying a total of more than 500 kilograms of cannabis that had been seized in various cases and stored at the city's Shirga and Highway Police Station. The court then laid down guidelines for the police to auction or dispose of the cannabis. There's a rat menace in almost all police stations. Hence, necessary arrangements need to be made to safeguard the cannabis that's been confiscated, the court document said. However, accounts regarding the exact sequence of events that follow the rat's alleged consumption of the cannabis appear a little hazy. Speaking after the court case, Mathura City Police Superintendent Martin Prakish Singh told CNN that the cannabis had been destroyed by rains and flooding, and not by rats. There was no reference to rats in the report submitted to the court. The police only mentioned that the seized cannabis was destroyed in the rains and flooding, he said. If the rats are guilty as charged, they might now be taking things easy. A 2016 study by the University of British Columbia found the main psychoactive ingredient in marijuana made lab rats lazy. Researchers trained 29 rats to perform an experiment in which the rodents had to choose between a simple or more difficult task to earn treats. The rats typically chose the harder and more rewarding task, but after being given marijuana, the same rats picked the easier task. Well, that was just because they were stoned, and they wanted to enjoy it a little bit more. (laughs) As always, if you ever have a comment on anything you hear on the Cannabis Podcast, please send a note to info at CannabisPodcast.com. And if you want to support the podcast, you can look at the various options at buymeacoffee.com slash cannabis podcast. If you like what you hear and you feel so inclined, you can always buy me a doobie. That's it for episode 111 and the beginning of year number five of the Cannabis Podcast. From the Cannabis Infused Studio, high above the Okanagan Valley, this was the Cannabis Podcast. Thanks for listening to today's show. To check out more great cannabis podcasts, go to podconnects.com. Here's a preview of one of our other shows. I'm Joyce Gerber, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast, The Canna Mom Show. And we are on a mission to enhance the impact women have on this industry as business professionals, healthcare providers, policy advocates, caregivers, moms, by sharing and preserving their stories of love and kindness, wisdom, and hope. I am so grateful to have found my tribe of Canna podcasters right here on PodConX and look forward to our work of crushing the stigma around cannabis and caregivers and building this new industry together.